So welcome again to the Potential Grants Applicants Workshop. I'm going to go through a few introductory remarks before our guest, the Assistant Secretary, shows up. Um, let me just say again that we, I'm very, we're very pleased to host this uh, Potential Grant Applicants Workshop, which is kind of an awkward way to put it, but it spells it out right there. Um, I would ask that you fill out the application form before you leave today. This is important for us to ensure that future workshops are responsive to your needs and questions. I think this is the third or fourth one that we've hosted and every year we change it based on the feedback we hear. So it's really important for us to hear, look, I wish you'd talk more about this and less about that. So we can and adjust it accordingly. And um, also, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box that's at the registration table out in the um, lobby right here. Also at the registration table, please leave business cards if you want to share your contact information with other participants. I believe we're going to share a list of those who are here today so that you can continue networking even outside uh, of this uh, fora. Also it will be helpful for us for our database to make sure we do include everyone who's out there in the larger grants community because we do, as you know, occasionally send out email blasts to people in the grants community. And lastly, a very important housekeeping note, please no food or drink in the auditorium. I'm the exception to the rule because I'm speaking here, but they won't let us use this space again if we have stains here. So please um, no food or drink here in this room. You can obviously drink it out there where we have coffee and water. And then lastly, please return your badges that you have, uh, visitors badges that is. They have to go back to our diplomatic security people and they know how many they issued us and they'll know how many we send back. So please cooperate in that uh, sense of the word. Um, for today's workshop, the topics that we're going to go over are first an overview of DRL, of the Bureau, how it's uh, broken down uh, organizationally, structurally. We're going to have our Assistant Secretary come in and speak, followed by a panel that will talk about the policy priorities, the democracy and human rights policy priorities that we have here in DRL where we have various members of front office and office directors and others to talk about specific focus areas that DRL has. Then we will turn to the overview of the programming process, programming and grants process um, that we'll get into how it is, the sausage making that goes behind the decision making of how we make uh, awarded grants. We'll have a session on monitoring and evaluation, particularly as our um, requirements for that increase and we're trying out or we're, we'll be integrating or sorry, we'll be um, beginning a new evaluation process. We'll have a session on how to integrate marginalized populations into your proposals and into the work that you do. This is obviously a priority for not just GRL but the secretary and we thought this might be helpful for you to go through to understand we've had evaluation done how best to do that sort of kind of best practices or why things might not be going as we had hoped or as you had hoped. Hopefully this will give you some tips on how to improve your proposals and uh, operationalizing that goal. Uh, we're having a session on the new super circular, which is going to take play, uh, start on December 26th of this year, which is to consolidate all the various grants regulations out there. I know you're at the edge of your seat waiting to know about that. Uh, then we will having a closing session with questions and answers particularly those questions that you would have provided to the registration table. And then lastly, I think we built in a little free time for networking at the end. Uh, just to let you know that to ensure fairness and transparency, particularly for potential grantees who can't, don't live in DC area and can't make it, all of the presentation slideshows that we're doing today will be on DRL's website for those who are not able to attend. So without further ado, I am going to turn it over to our Assistant Secretary, Tom Malinowski. We are so pleased to have had him here. I've known Tom for years, and I don't know a better advocate and fighter, effective fighter for democracy and human rights. He joins us from having previously been at Human Rights Watch and served under President Clinton. So we're dealing with a seasoned person who's very effective, very well known in the community. And I'm going to turn him over to him to talk a little bit about the broader priorities as Assistant Secretary for the President and for the, the Secretary. Tom? Thank you, Pat. Thank you, everybody. <clears throat> How do you get to be seasoned? 
I was <laughs> wondered about that. I guess. Um, so welcome everybody. Uh, somewhere in a secure conference room in Beijing or Moscow or Cairo, there are people meeting and complaining about the nefarious conspiracy to promote revolutions and overthrow governments around the world and how dangerous it is. And here you are. You don't look actually all that dangerous to me. Um, but anyway, it's, it's wonderful to, to have you here. Um, welcome to uh, our annual Bitters Conference. Um, I'm very gratified to see so many of our dedicated friends and partners uh, here today. And I hope you used your three-day weekend well to prepare for having to sit through eight hours of conversations about how the US government bureaucracy works. Um, I hear there are many, many exciting topics on the agenda today, like how to fill out your SFPPR forms, <laughs> how to get a DUNS number, that's an important one, how to use PMS, <laughs> that's what it's called, right? All right, fine. Um, and, and I see here on the agenda there's going to be a whole hour on something called the super circular. We used to just have an ordinary circular, but that wasn't good enough, apparently. Um, anyway, and I don't know what any of those things are myself, so maybe I should stay and, and find out. Anyway, so, but this is a very important event, as you guys um, know, um, not just for us to tell you about various little changes in how we uh, administer and, uh, and run things, but, but also, and much more important, uh, for us to uh, engage um, the folks out there uh, who actually have Birkenstocks on the ground, as we like to say. Um, and that's both a joke, but it's also a very, very serious point um, in this day and age um, of um, security risks and challenges and sensitivity about American presence and American quote-unquote boots on the ground uh, around the world. It is so, so important um, that we have uh, friends and partners uh, with whom we work who are out there in countries like Iraq, um, like Syria even, um, throughout Africa, throughout Asia, throughout the former uh, Soviet Union talking to people, forging relationships, forging friendships, gathering information, understanding what's really going on in places where even American diplomats sometimes have a hard time um, going. Um, and, and even more important than that, delivering a message to all those people out there who are alternatively ignored or persecuted by their governments, uh, people who are made to feel like they have absolutely no power, people who are made to feel that nobody out there cares about them, and telling them that, yes, somebody does care. The American people care. The most powerful government in the world cares. Um, that we are willing to help them fight for their rights, to demand that their governments be responsive to their people, um, to fight for justice for everybody, to fight for the principle that states should serve their citizens and not the other way around. And to do it in a way that doesn't undermine their independence. Because one thing that we expect all of our grantees and all of our partners around the world to do is to tell us what we're doing wrong. And they're in here every single day actually doing exactly that. And that's something that makes me very proud, that those are the kinds of friends and partners that we seek out um, around the world. Um, and it's important to the work that we do, to the larger work we do here um, at the State Department, because when you think about it, when you look around the world, um, look at the problems that we face right now, and you see that in almost every single case, it is the absence of a strong and empowered civil society that is at the root, that is at the heart of the fundamental challenges that we face as a country. Look at the problem in Ukraine. Um, a government next door in Russia um, threatened by the rise of a movement of empowered citizens demanding greater democracy, 
puts that movement down, and then three years later, another movement arises in Ukraine. Um, the government in Russia, threatened by that, and takes an action that now has created a first order security crisis for the United States. Look at what's happening in the Middle East. Um, another authoritarian government in Syria trying to put down a brave and courageous, initially nonviolent movement for greater democracy, for greater human rights, um, and in the process, um, not only destroying its own country, but creating a vacuum out of which emerged ISIL, drawing us back into a conflict um, in the Middle East. Um, so there you have it right there, just the, you know, the two biggest crises that we face in the world um, because of the absence of the kinds of institutions that you guys are out there promoting every single day. So that's why, in addition to all the obviously good moral reasons, this is um, important to, that, to us. So we, we deeply appreciate and admire your dedication, your courage, to stay in places like Iraq and Syria, in Ukraine, um, to support activists in places like Cuba, in Azerbaijan, in Iran, in Sudan, places where they are most threatened, um, and your effectiveness in making democratic change happen, uh, even when it happens slowly, um, from Kenya to Pakistan to Burma, um, even maybe someday in China. Now, we've worked with you guys in many different ways. Um, and one way that we, we particularly um, like to work these days is through uh, our uh, uh, rapid response funds, which allow us to do something that the U.S. government under normal circumstances is very bad at doing, and that's responding very quickly um, to help meet the needs uh, of people uh, around the world. So whether it's the Fundamental Freedoms Fund, Dignity for All, uh, Lifeline, Embattled CSO Assistance Funds, the Justice and Dignity Initiative, Digital Defenders Program, um, and so on and so on. Um, six consortia. Uh, made up now of over 35 different organizations supported not just by the U.S. government but by other governments around the world, which also I think enables us to strengthen the, the message that, that our assistance um, delivers. Uh, it, it has uh, expanded our reach and enabled us um, to really meet the needs uh, of folks out there um, who want and, and need our help. We've been able in this way to get, for example, um, monitors, uh, uh, election monitors trained and on the ground in Burma uh, when by-elections uh, were very suddenly called uh, there uh, a couple of years ago. Um, we were the first to address the need for transitional justice uh, in post-conflict uh, Mali using these programs. We've conducted surveys in Sudan, South Sudan and Syria that have provided vital information on human rights uh, abuses there to the international community. And we've done this in a lot of places that are completely outside of the headlines, but are just uh, as uh, important. For example, uh, just a few of hundreds. Um, we've done vital work on mining legislation that will protect local communities uh, in Guinea. Uh, we cleaned up the voter registry uh, ahead of elections uh, in Honduras. Uh, we helped women participate uh, in their government as democracy is slowly restored uh, in Fiji. We provided recommendations to reform media and human rights laws uh, in Sudan and Somalia, Somalia, sorry. And we do this in country after country around the world. Right now, DRL is administering 315 programs totaling more than $500 million, supporting democracy efforts and promoting human rights around the world. The majority of these programs operate in closed societies run by authoritarian or repressive regimes including in countries where the United States government has no diplomatic presence, no USAID missions. Now, you'll learn a lot more about uh, some of the specific programs that we run and the panels and discussions uh, ahead. Let me just say a few more words, though, about the, the challenges that we face. We have seen in the last few years um, just how um, determinedly and in some cases ruthlessly, authoritarian governments have pushed back on civil society organizations and in particular on the idea that um, human rights groups, NGOs, should be able to receive funding from sources all around the world, including the
the United States. We are spreading best practices. They are trying to spread worst practices. So you see, for example, the development of repressive internet legislation in China and then the Chinese government shopping that around to governments around the world. You see the Russian government shopping around its repressive um, legislation to make life as difficult as possible for um, NGOs. Um, you know, as Americans, we like to think that the solutions that we promote around the world, nice ideas like good governance and transparency, governments that respond to their people's needs, that promote services and, and, and so forth, that, that these are win-win ideas, that everybody should love them, that, um, that the promotion of these ideas should not cause friction um, with governments around the world. Um, but that's a little bit naive because, of course, all of these ideas are deeply, deeply threatening to um, powerful people, powerful governments that benefit from the absence uh, of those kinds of institutions. And when they are challenged, of course they are going to fight back. Now, as a result of that, some people have asked, very understandably, whether we sometimes do more harm than good by funding um, democracy and human rights groups around the world, NGOs, others who do this work? Do we make grantees into targets sometimes? Do we, by our support for more open societies, stimulate the passage of legislation um, that leads to more closed societies? And here, of course, we have to be careful. We have to be sensitive. We have to take these things on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to constantly learn to do better. We have to constantly adjust, and we have to be open to critical perspectives. But the fundamental question of whether we do more good than harm, for me, is answered every single day. When I go out there or you know, to the closed societies where we do business, uh, and I meet the folks who still want to partner with us, brave people who face these challenges, who risk a lot more than anybody in this room ever risks, who risk prison, who risk worse, and they still want to partner with us. They still want us there. They still want to beat back the assertion of their governments that nobody cares about them. Um, so that helps answer the question for me. And I also remember that at the end of the day, authoritarian governments don't lash out at this kind of work because it's supported by the United States. They don't lash out because it's American. They may say that's what they're doing, but that's not the reason they're doing it. They lash out because it's effective. And the only way to stop them from lashing out is by doing things that are ineffective. And I will refuse to do that, and I know you refuse to do that. If all of this kind of support were provided by some neutral international foundation or by the United Nations, and of course we want the UN, we want foundations, we want all kinds of actors in this field, but if all of this work were supported by those kinds of actors and it was done effectively, authoritarian governments would still push back. If the United States got out of this business for 10 straight years, if every single day we got up on the podium at the State Department and said, we don't do this anymore, those governments wouldn't believe us anyway. And they would still see its self-interest in trying to castigate their own civil society as being tools of the United States. So what I conclude is that all that is left to us is to try to do this as well as we possibly can, as sensitively as we possibly can as effectively as we possibly can. That's the only answer. And in the long run, um, I think it is making a difference, which is precisely, again, why we're seeing a backlash. So going forward, um, we have got to do everything we possibly can uh, to try to help those societies that are moving forward towards greater democracy and openness succeed, whether that's a Burma, whether that's a Tunisia, um, or what have you. We've got to do more creative things, um, like fighting, uh, empowering local groups to fight not just political repression, but the corruption that is often the root cause um, of, uh, of what authoritarian governments do, um, and the corruption that often um, is their greatest political um, vulnerability. Um, we need to help them break strangleholds uh, on the free flow of information, especially online. And I think you guys are going to talk a lot more about uh, our internet freedom programming, which remains a very, very high 
uh, priority for us. And we've got to just continually address the shrinking space for civil society in countries where our partners and our friends uh, are for now uh, on the defensive. Many of you saw uh, at the UN General Assembly uh, this year, President Obama um, uh, went to the Clinton Global Initiative and he gave a, a really powerful speech um, on America's commitment to continue to do these things. On the same day, he issued a presidential memorandum instructing every single agency in the US government, not just the State Department, domestic and foreign, um, to make engagement with civil society uh, among its top priorities. Um, so that is our commitment, um, a commitment to continue to stand with embattled activists um, who are fighting for the values that we share with them, who are fighting for a world um, that we have very much of an interest in seeing uh, come into being, to stand with them in the face of whatever challenges they may face. We rely on your help to do that, we count on your help to do that, and we want to empower you to do that. So thank you very much. Um, I have a few minutes, I think, to take a few questions. Five minutes? Okay. So if anyone wants to start. Okay. We give out a $25,000 grant for, to whoever asked the first question. So. <laughs> Thanks, indeed. Uh, I'm Yasser. It's, it's competitive. <laughs> Shall I start? Yeah, go ahead. That's yeah, okay. I'm Yasser Al Fakhrani from Egypt. Uh, just my question is about your situation. I mean, the State Department, uh, with what happened in Egypt and what happened in Ukraine. Uh, I see some sort of, you know, double standards. So, how can you explain this, sir? Thanks, indeed. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> How can I explain double standards? Uh, there's so many possible ways in which to uh, criticize us for double standards, I'm not even sure which ones you're talking about. Um, well, I do think that there, there are some significant differences. Um, where we have in Ukraine, fundamentally what we see is a breach of one of the most fundamental uh, norms of international conduct. We have a, a one country, in this case a great power, which makes it all the more threatening, uh, invading another country um, to interrupt a fledgling democratic experiment uh, in that country in, in Ukraine. And that for us is a first order international challenge. Um, now, both Egypt and Ukraine have in common a civil society that campaigned for many, many years uh, to try to achieve greater respect for democracy, human rights, and rule of law uh, in their societies. And in both countries, um, whether we face a moment of opportunity as we do in Ukraine or a moment of challenge as we do in Egypt, our commitment is to continue to stand by those folks um, who are struggling, whether they are up or whether they are down. Secretary Kerry was just in Cairo um, this weekend uh, and a big part of that trip was to talk to uh, the, the government there about uh, the, uh, their plans to enforce a very, very repressive and draconian NGO law. Uh, uh, plans that were once delayed and we hope will continue to be delayed uh, to force groups that have, have avoided registration under this law um, to in fact register and to come essentially under the control uh, of the state. Um, and a very, very strong message was delivered on that, I can, I can tell you. Thank you very much, Assistant Secretary Malinowski. My name is Fred Oladende with the Foundation for Democracy in Africa. And I have two questions. One is, given the current situation in West Africa, particularly the Ebola crisis, and the fact that civil society in those regions are on that very severe severe economic uh, situation in terms of their work. Are you thinking of any special windows to look at helping those civil society organizations to become relevant uh, during the Ebola crisis and beyond the Ebola crisis? My other question has to do with economic freedom. And I know you agree with me that uh, some of the best ways 
to advance democracy is to ensure that we empower people economically. And we're going to be seeing uh, different programs unfolding that will look at economic freedom and political freedom coming and embracing to move freedom in some of the poorest countries in the world, particularly in Africa. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on the first one, I'm, I'll just say we're open to suggestions. Uh, we, um, this is not a system in which we come up with all the ideas and then ask you guys to go and implement them. You guys come up with most of the ideas. And then we try to pick the, the best ones uh, with our limited funds and, and help you run with them. So by all means, if you have uh, ideas in terms of strengthening civil society in the face of the Ebola crisis, come, come to us and we will, uh, we will look at that. Uh, on your question on economic freedom, I completely agree. One of, first of all, one of the points that we make uh, in a lot of authoritarian societies around the world is that the same rights that, that civil society demands, um, accountable government, rule of law, independent courts, free press uh, that can expose things like corruption and bad governance, there's exactly the same things uh, that business people uh, need, that foreign investors need uh, and demand. Um, you can't have, you, you can't shut down space for civil society uh, and expect to have the kind of vibrant, um, open environment uh, for economic growth that most countries around the world say that they want. In terms of our assistance programs, uh, it also helps tremendously um, to promote bottom-up development um, if we are um, interested in building uh, democracy, um, whether it's through microcredit, supporting small business, um, uh, access to justice, which is important for, uh, again, for citizens as well as businesses in places where that's lacking. Uh, in terms of actually doing that, that is more of a USAID mission than a DRL mission simply because we don't have unlimited funds. Nobody does, but ours are even uh, more limited than, uh, than others. Um, but we do work with DRL in the countries that, uh, we work with USAID in countries that are priority uh, targets for us, um, and, and we work to promote exactly that kind of philosophy and approach. Thanks. I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm Raisel Wyman from the Dialogue Institute at Temple University. We have both the good fortune, but also the burden of doing the religious pluralism projects for SUSE from the other part of the State Department that are education. If we do a good job, which I think we're doing a pretty good job, we send back people who are working on religious pluralism in places that they have no support. And they have, we have no continued grant for us to help them, including Yazidis and uh, Kurds right now. We're right now in a, in a place where our students who go back, incredible students and, and sometimes faculty, one of the biggest problems is we don't have the faculty or other people on that side to continue to organize them and help them. They're individual students that we have been had to, on our own, out of our own personal pockets sometimes, uh, take them from Baghdad to the north, uh, to take them out of Cairo, to uh, help people out of Beirut. We had uh, two defect from, uh, from th this year. I mean, it's been terrible because there is no support for them once they do um, be able to articulate these values and the exact same concepts that we're helping them or that they're asking for, that they want on the ground there to be able to be effective back in their own countries without endangering them. And the issue of the risks, we, we started getting involved in scholars at risk, but it's not enough. And particularly when they're not scholars, they're students. We are, this is why we're here today, because we have to find ways to, emerge, to, to help them continue to articulate what we have been training and been working on, and a lot of money has been put into it by State Department already on issues of democracy and pluralism. But once you send them back, they have no, no support, no, no infrastructure, and certainly no uh, faculty to help them when they're working in their universities or their schools or some other kind of way. No adult corresponding. It's, a, it's totally uncoordinated when they go back. Yep. I don't know if you have any ideas or thoughts. We have lots of ideas, but uh, right now <laughs> we're bringing over the Yazidi woman from parliament uh, to this country on her own penny because mm -hmm. we don't know how to we, we just know that they have to be able to speak there in their own voice. Well, thank you for doing that, because otherwise th they would have no voice. 
um, and their voice has been extremely important in the last couple of months. You know, I imagine 99% of the people in this building who, you know, are a group of people who know a lot about the world probably never heard of the Yazidis until a couple of months ago. But one part of the department that had um, were the folks working on religious freedom and religious pluralism. And, you know, it turns out that they knew something that was really important. Um, because what was happening to religious minorities in Iraq was an early warning sign of the crisis that, uh, that we now face. And the relationships, as I was arguing at the beginning, that, that, um, that we helped forge through these partnerships with, with these groups that were so obscure before, that were seen as not particularly important to anything, those relationships turned out to be profoundly important when that moment of crisis um, came. Um, and, you know, so now it's front and center. And, um, you know, that's a good thing. It doesn't fully answer the question that, that you posed. Um, and, you know, we, as much as we can do and should do and will try to do through the programming, we also know that the programming by itself is nothing without the policies um, and the diplomacy to back them up. Um, and so one of our uh, big challenges, uh, a challenge we're very seized with uh, in the coming months uh, and years uh, in Iraq in particular, is to make sure that these folks have a country to go home to uh, and a country where their communities can continue to survive and thrive. Uh, and again, we can help in all kinds of ways through you know, a little grant here, a little grant there. Uh, but more important will be uh, insisting that the Iraqi authorities uh, who we're coming to the rescue of right now uh, understand that part of the expectation is that they will create an environment in the future uh, in which these communities feel protected. Um, and I can't promise you that's going to happen given what they have experienced. Uh, but I can promise you that we are completely committed to that task. And again, we'll need you, your ideas, and your support to help make it happen. So thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing.